Um, CEO is, is actually a play on word by, by the CEO. We were created 21 years ago, and we, we've, what we tell of ourselves is we are researchers, but we have a critical perspective, so we also have a, a position, a put, so we're not objective. We, we think that the lobbying is, is too much influence of corporations on EU policy making, and so that's our political stance, but we do some research to highlight this. The reason why I'm going to talk about ISDSC that you see later on is that to us it's also a political tool and it's actually used quite a lot uh, for lobbying purposes. Anybody's heard of ISDS before? Before you knew I was coming and you Googled it? Yeah, you did some? Yeah? Okay, <coughs> great. All right, so I'm going to have a, the idea is to explain to you what it is, obviously. It's where it comes from, the history, um, the entire system that's around it at the moment, the arbitration industry and the links it has with uh, politics and, and money. Then I'll talk about some cases and then the debates are currently happening because there's quite a lot of public opposition around it. So ISDS is, stands for Investor State Dispute Settlement. So it's a court that is available for investors when they have a problem with a state. So that's the investor. The, the definition of investor is pretty broad. So as long as you're a shareholder, you are considered an investor. And if you invest in a state where you have a treaty there, so there's a treaty between the home country and the, uh, of the investor and the state where the investor is investing. So that's the basis upon which there's a court for it. So if you have a deal, let's say, between Indonesia and in Singapore, <laughs> if you're an Indonesian investor, it gives you the right to sue the state, but not in the national courts, in a special court system outside of the state. One thing that is um, already controversial, as you can see, is that it's only a one-way system. So you have a dispute where only the investor can bring a claim against the state on the basis of the rights that were given on the treaty. So you have no obligations for the investor, and you have no, no possibility for the state to actually sue the investor. So it's only a one way. The investor can sue on the basis of three things. A new law, uh, a new court justice, a court decision, or a decree. So if there is any of those three things that are contested by the investor, and he thinks or she thinks that it thinks the rights that were given to the, by him, by the treaty, are not being respected, then they can go to, to this court system. <coughs> so what we see as a problem is first the idea that you actually give the investors the rights and no obligations, but you also give the investors the right to choose the system that they want when they invest in the country. So they get the possibility to either go to national courts or to go to a separate legal system. So in a, in a way it breaks the idea that we call in front of the law because you give certain parts of society the right to choose the justice that they prefer. And the thing, the problems that we've seen until now is that the, at the beginning this system was used for investors that were investing in very unstable countries where they didn't trust the court system. They didn't believe that the national justice system was going to give them any compensation if there were expropriation for instance. So they asked for this special justice because they didn't trust the national one. But what we've seen happening more and more is that we've seen uh, investors using this system to actually get a lot of public money for issues that they, uh, laws that they don't like. And they've also been using it as a threat in order, not, in order for new legislation not to come to light. And obviously, as we'll see later, we believe that it, it contradicts certain principles of the rule of law. You're going to see that I'm, I'm quite critical of this system, but you'll see that I'm not the only one. So we have uh, this quote from a former arbitrator. Because what happens if there's, a state, there's an investor that sues the state, and then there's three arbitrators that decides on the case. So it's three people that are paid by the day or by the hour to actually decide on this case. And one of them that used to be an arbitrator has uh, quoted this before, where he doesn't understand it doesn't seem to amaze him why states have signed to investment arbitration. Because to him, is what, um, what he points here, it's the arbitrators. The fact that you have three people paid by the hour, three investment lawyers that get to review all national laws and decide whether 
they uh, are against or not um, an international treaty. And this is another quote from a UN expert. Uh, there was the UN has asked uh, Alfred Desayas to actually have a look at um, investment uh, arbitration. And to him, the problem is that you put companies' rights above human rights. So where does it come from? In the 50s and 60s, it actually comes from northern investors, northern countries, that wanted to invest in the south, but the south were, the colonies were getting independent. And the northern investors didn't actually trust um, when they were investing in, in those new states that the investment will actually be protected. So what happened is the first, what we call bilateral investment treaty, so when you have two countries that sign an investment treaty, was signed in 59 by Germany and Pakistan. Is anybody from Pakistan here? What was happening in the 59 in Pakistan? And this is in this context that Germany believes, due to political instability, that their investment could be seized or anything could happen in the country without them being able to get their money back. So that's when we have the first bilateral investment treaty which gives rights to investors. For at that time, it's only rights. So in German investors get extra rights when they invest in Pakistan. But 10 years later, we have the Netherlands that signs a similar deal with Indonesia. But they're not only in this, so in this case, it's not only rights to investors, but it's also the court system. So a, a system in order um, to use if those rights are not respected. And here we're in 69. So that's where we start having ISDS in treaties, in bilateral treaties between countries. So this um, is a protection for Indonesian investors in the Netherlands and Dutch investors in Indonesia. And if any of those investors think the rights are not respected of those treaty, they can use ISDS. But since then, since the 19s, and especially since NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, this system has been used more and more, and you see it much more in um, bilateral investment treaties where it, becomes very, it becomes very, very common to add it in, in the treaty. So then we have, in the 19s, we have an explosion of treaties with ISDS, which means that we get an explosion of cases, obviously. So this is, you see the number of ISDS cases? This is from uh, UNCTAD database. They have a website called ISDS Navigator. And you see in the 90s, 80s, there's very few cases. That's 2000 and that's 2015. It's almost 700 cases now that we know of. Because when you, when you have an investor that actually sue a state, you don't actually have to tell it publicly. So there are cases happening that we don't know about. This is only the known cases that the UN has been compiling together for the last um, almost 20 years. So we're about 700 cases. So if you look at the, 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 the database, now we have uh, 817 known cases. And last in 2017, we had 35 new per year. So we really see an explosion of cases where it becomes very common now for investors to see. It's quite uneven for these pictures because, as you can tell, um, in Latin America, for instance, you see also quite a lot of cases. It's almost 30% of all the cases, and in this um, part of the oldest cases that we've, we looked at, the 70% are actually won by the investor. <coughs> and the cost of it has been 20.5 billion US dollar. That's all the cases, and a lot of it as well, we've seen that 23% actually happens in the mining, the gas, and the oil industry. They use um, ISDS a lot. One of the issues with ISDS is it's actually a very close community. The number of arbitrators and lawyers that work in those cases is very limited. It's a very close club, and it's a club of people that earn a lot of money from cases. There's a lot of money involved in this industry. To give you an idea, it's about five million for a state when they're to defend themselves when they are, get sued by an investor. Five million US dollar. 
because you have to pay for the lawyers that represent you and you have to share the cost of the arbitration, which is really high. As an arbitrator, you're expected to earn about 2,000 US dollar a day. And then when that's only for the, for the procedure, if a state then loses and have to pay compens compensation, it can go into billions. There's a case where Russia had to pay 9 billion US dollars to the investor in terms of compensation. Because what happens in those treaties gives you, investors are protected from expropriation, so you're actually taking away your asset, you're taking away your factory, or you're taking away your financial investment. But you also have the right to be given the money for what they call an indirect expropriation and for future lost profit. Meaning that you get the investor gets compensation not only for the money that they've lost at the moment, but for all the profits that they were hoping to make with the money they invested. And that's why the amount of money gets really, really high, because you also get compensation for all the money you should have earned, but you haven't. And that's why you see numbers getting super, uh, super high. This is the three uh, biggest uh, law firms that do ISDS. So you have Freshfields, White and & Case, and King & Spalding. That's really uh, big players. Um, the partners, as you can see them, so the partners are either lawyers or arbitrators in cases. So they have a, a represent state investors, or they are the judges, the arbitrators. And a partner in those three firms gets uh, about 1.9 million or 1.4 million US dollar per year. So as you can see, there's a lot of money involved. I was telling you, it's, um, yeah, it's about 5 million per party when there is a case. And 80% of all those costs go to the lawyers. And as I was telling you, oh, it's 3,000 US per day. ICSID is actually the center where most of those cases happen. They can happen in the Chamber of Commerce in Paris or in Stockholm. But most of them happen in ICSID. ICSID is in the World Bank. It's actually, um, it was at, the, at the beginning, it was made for investors that were receiving World Bank money and were investing in countries. So they were provided with a court in case there was a dispute. And then it became the place where most of ISDS cases are happening. So that's in, in Washington. There's also one um, in Den Haag. But the majority of them happen in, in ICSID. I want to show you a little bit how the whole industry works because there's a lot of links between politics and the arbitration industry and um, the academia as well. Uh, for instance, if you look at one of the top arbitrators, it's called Yves Fortier. He's one of the arbitrators that you see a lot in a lot of uh, very big cases. Um, so he is one of the biggest uh, arbitrator, but he was also the Canadian ambassador and permanent representative to the United Nations in New York. So whilst he was actually judging a lot of cases, uh, I want to show you here his, his, his bio. Um, he's actually been, he's, hmm? why does it not work anymore? Um, okay, you'll see, if you type him on Google on your laptops, you'll find out that he's actually been a very known arbitrator. So a person deciding on cases. And at the same time, he was the Canadian ambassador. So it becomes very difficult for, there's a bit of a conflict of interest, because it becomes difficult also to have a critical perspective on ISDS when you have such links between the industry and the political world. I hope it works again. OK, no, it doesn't work. Ah, OK. I will need you for the video. Over. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> and um, one, also, one problem also is, this is a, an official document. So what we do in Corporate Europe Observatory is we use a transparency directive in the European Union, which gives us the right to ask for official documents. This is a meeting that happened between the vice president of Chevron, the big oil and gas company, we know, and the DG trade in the European Union, it was, it was in September 2014. So as a European citizen, you're entitled to ask for minutes of meetings or any correspondence between uh, the EU institutions, most of them, and external stakeholders. In this um, uh, meeting, Chevron, the vice president, say that ISDS has only been used once by Chevron. This was in Ecuador. Is anybody from Ecuador? There was a huge oil spill in the Amazonian forest in Ecuador, and Chevron was asked to pay to actually clean that spill, 
and sh the company refuses to pay to clean it. So it, there was a case from uh, Ecuador started suing Chevron. It ended up in the Ecuadorian Supreme Court, and Chevron was asked to pay to clean the oil spill in the forest. What Chevron did was they did ISDS. So they claimed their rights was not respected, and now they're having a case in their ISDS where now Ecuador has to pay for that case, and still it's ongoing, it takes a long time. Because obviously, if you earn $3,000 a day, you've got an interest in making it last longer, right? So the cases are actually taking quite a long time. Um, so in this case, it's, uh, Chevron says, so the vice president, Mr. Scott, has only been used once by Chevron in this litigation against Ecuador, yet Chevron agrees that the mere existence of ISDS is important as it acts as a deterrent. Because imagine the power you can have as an investor when you can go and see a governmental representative and say, this new legislation that you're considering, actually, this will cost you a lot of money because I might sue you in ISDS cases. And if you are a government representative and you, believe, and you think, wow, this is on average five million US dollars that I will have to pay just to defend myself, then you're probably gonna think twice before you, do, you act and you make a new law happen. So it does have a big deterrent effect. We've seen it at Togo, where Philip Morris actually threatened Togo with an ISDS cases when Togo wanted to pass anti-smoking legislation. And Togo actually hasn't passed that law. And they actually changed their mind. And it's quite, IS, uh, ISDS has been used by Philip Morris in Uruguay and in Australia. And they've used it because there were new laws about smoking in those. But they've used it also in the case of Australia for New Zealand to warn New Zealand what could happen. And in the case of Uruguay, to warn Argentina and Brazil. So it also has quite a lot of political effect because surrounding countries, neighboring countries, realize that they might actually, might actually cost them a lot of money to have a new legislation on tobacco. And it is a lot of money. If you think about, um, there is a case against Ecuador where Ecuador had to pay 1.1 billion US dollars. That's 1% of GDP of Ecuador. There's also a case in Libya where it was a uh, Saudi investor that invested for a, a hotel, the tourist uh, um, investment in Libya, and then the war started, obviously. So they only invested 35 million US dollars because they only invested to you know, uh, look at how the ground was, how they could build a project, but there was not actually any construction that started. They won their ISDS cases, and Libya had to pay 935 US million dollars. That's crazy. That's crazy when you think it was, it's 900 million US dollars that Libya had to pay an investor. And that's what the profits that the investor wanted to make. There are cases where it's so expensive for a country when they get sued that they actually settle. They, they, they find an agreement and they pay rather than keep paying for the procedures that keep dragging and dragging on and on and on. There's a case in Poland <coughs> where Poland had promised to privatize more its health insurance market. So um, it, the health insurance market, 20% of it was privatized, so it was under private insurance. And the government had promised it will go to 51%. And then the government changed. So it, and the new government didn't actually give those shares to the investors. So a Dutch investors sued Poland because they had been promised something that they didn't get. So they had expected certain profits that they didn't get. So Poland, looking at the price of all the procedures, actually settled and they settled for two billion, more than two billion euros for Dutch investors. And it's the equivalent of the salary um, of 200,000 uh, Polish nurses in a year. That's a crazy amount of money if you think about it. And also, we're not talking about poor corporations or, or small and medium enterprise investing in countries. This is a study that's been made by a Canadian uh, legal professor, and he found out that the awards, the awards being the compensation that the investors receive, 94.5% of the time it goes to companies with over 1 billion US dollar in annual revenue, or to individuals with more than 100 million US dollar in net wealth. So we're talking about giving in the case of Libya, for more than $900 million to investors that are usually already very rich people. And also, it raises a question, because as an investor, when you invest in a country, you can actually have an insurance for political risks. 
you can buy an insurance that actually insures you against any risk you might take and receive some money back in case you're being expropriated or in case you have any problems. So should the taxpayers be paying for those investors when they take risks or should those investors actually buy an insurance? Those are two cases. There's uh, one in Germany. Anybody from Germany? Yeah, have you heard about the Vattenfall case in Germany? Yeah, maybe you can tell us the second one because there's two of them. Ah, okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the one on nuclear. Yeah, I mean, it's the uh, same procedures always for Vattenfall. Uh, when I, I was it because of uh, Germany decided to go out of the nuclear uh, yeah. energy provisions mm -hmm. uh, and to shift towards sustainable energy, and then Vattenfall uh, filed a suit against the German state. Yeah. Um, Germany would not have gone out of the uh, sustainable energy. Yeah, exactly. It was after Fukushima when um, Germany decided to uh, phase out nuclear energy. Phase out meaning, it doesn't mean it closed all its nuclear plants the next day. It means that there will, no contract will be renewed on nuclear energy. So you know, no new nuclear power capacity. Um, Vattenfall sued. Vattenfall is a Swedish company. It used a treaty called the Energy Charter to sue and it's asking for 4.7 billion euro to the German state for future lost profits because they were hoping to use their power plant much longer than they will because the co after the end of the contract there'll be no renewal. There's actually four cases against Germany. The first one, Vattenfall, was used against the city of Hamburg. The city of Hamburg had a new council and they asked Vattenfall to clean the water out of their coal power station. So there was a coal power station being built next to the Elbe, the, the river in the north of Germany. And they were only asking for a tower to be added in order for the water to be cleaner when it went back into the river. That's just an additional investment for Vattenfall. Vattenfall sued, and because it was so expensive, the city council changed their mind and told them, OK, fine, don't worry about it. Don't build that water. It's too expensive for us, the ISDS cases. What is happening now in this case is that the Commission is suing Germany because the water in the delta is too polluted and there's not enough uh, birds and, um, and fauna and flora, basically. It doesn't respect the natural habitats directive and the health is too polluted. It's quite <coughs> and the fourth and the, the third and the fourth one, I'd love to tell you who's the investor, on what basis, how much they're claiming, but we don't know. Because those cases have been claimed, uh, they've been, they, we know that an investor has, has uh, put a claim, but that's the only thing we know. We don't know why and how much. And, and this is one also of the problem is you don't actually always know when cases are happening. There's another one in Lone Pine in Canada. Is anybody from Canada? Canada is actually one of the countries that's been sued the most since NAFTA. It's been sued a lot of times. In this case, it's been sued by a Canadian investor, Lone Pipe, who also happens to have a company in Delaware, in the US, obviously, for tax purposes. It's, it used NAFTA when uh, Quebec decided to put a, moran a moratorium on fracking. Do you know what fracking is, mm -hmm. all of you? It's when you extract gas from uh, the rock, you, so you open it with chemicals to extract gas. And because you use a lot of chemicals, it's very polluting and it, it's very controversial. So Lone Pipe was hoping to frack next to Saint Laurent, the river in Quebec, and it, a lot of op uh, opposition started, local opposition. And finally, after a lot of um, discussions and, impact and environmental impact assessment, fracking, uh, it was not banned, it's a moratorium. So for a certain amount of time, Quebec can, can't do fracking. So Lone Pipe used its US subsidiary in order to sue Canada and ask for money. This is a case that's still ongoing, and they're asking for, in this case, 109 million US dollar. In the case of uh, Vattenfall, it's 4.7 billion dollar. Euro, sorry. And for Vattenfall, we only know because an MP in the German Assembly actually asked the government, and they, were, they had to reveal the amount. But this is not something that we would know without uh, an MP asking. Um, obviously, you've seen what happened for a while with CETA and Magnet. 
If any of you come from Belgium? No? Okay, I'm the only one coming from Belgium. <laughs> Magnet was actually the president of the Wallonian parliament, and he's also an academic. He's actually studying American politics. So he knew what ISDS was. And when CETA was being negotiated, and then when it finally went through the council, Magnet actually discussed this with the parliament, because Wallonia has the right to actually have some, pow some power over EU politics. And to him, this was not legal. And to him, this was not appropriate. So actually, Wallonia took away the right for Belgium to sign CETA in the council. This means that when Trudeau was supposed to come from Canada with all uh, the EU um, uh, yeah, head of state there to sign, the Wallonian uh, head of state, or the uh, foreign minister, couldn't do anything. Literally couldn't say anything. Couldn't say Belgium I was agreeing to CETA. So then there was a whole saga about this. And finally, what came out of this is that um, the ECGs, the European Court of Justice, they've been asked by Belgium if those tribunals are legal according to EU law. There's one thing, for instance, is that the only body in Europe that can interpret EU law is the European Court of Justice. They are the judges that decide whether something is legal or not according to the treaties of the European Union. With ISDS, with CETA, for instance, that's the deal between Canada and the European Union, you would give Canadian investors the right to sue the European Union. So you would give private arbitrators, free private lawyers that have only studied investment law, that's the only thing they're really good at, the right to decide whether something is legal or not. So then you, the, you, the ECG would lose a lot of power. So now what we have is that we have a request to the European Court of Justice, and, um, yeah, and for the moment Belgium has not ratified CETA. But I wanted to show you a video if I can, um, of uh, the history of investment arbitration in South Africa. Is anybody from South Africa? I don't know any of the countries that I want. Um, so we did an event in, uh, in Brussels and we invited the uh, South African, so it's not the ambassador, he's a person working for the South Africa <laughs> embassy in Geneva, in the UN. <coughs> and he will explain the story of ISDS in South Africa, because that South Africa is actually a country that had a lot of bilateral treaties that include an ISDS. Then they were sued, and I'll explain how, and then they withdrew out of uh, bilateral investment treaties, and he will explain it more, and then I'll tell you more. Oui. Yeah, Merci. <laughs> Ah, mais en fait, nous, j'y arrive pas. <rire> Il est où Derrière. Ah. Kind of, uh, of a a vu, because I think our story really starts when uh, we become a, an independent nation, when Nelson Mandela is released. And so, at this point, um, there is this contention, but new government, new rules, and uh, foreign investors feel that they, their interests may be um, compromised. And at this point, the government is faced with a dilemma. What do we do to reassure investors that their rights are to be protected? Well, um, we've heard of these bilateral investment treaties. Um, let's have a look at them. Let's sign them. And of course, at that point, the issue was to reassure the international community that we were able to play ball. We were able to protect investors that were in the market. However, um, against this context, we also have a very sad history of racial discrimination. And as a result, a very robust constitution placed many obligations on the state to reverse this, including identifying those parts of the population who had been disregarded and actively implementing a legislative program to protect their interests. And this has come out in so-called black economic empowerment uh, programs, affirmative action programs, for instance. And so against this backdrop, when we start doing this, um, well, we find out that investors are unhappy because firstly, they never expected that these rules would apply to them 
and secondly, um, they feel that it's unfair for them to contribute to the redistribution of wealth in the country. And so, as a result, uh, we've had a few cases, one which we've lost, another which went the other way. But fundamentally, uh, what this has resulted in for us is that we have an obligation to regulate in the public interest, and um, we felt that bilateral investment treaties uh, were inhibiting uh, that particular constitutional obligation. On the other hand, if we did this to um, attract investment, was this a good ploy? Did we attract the investment that we thought we would get? The answer is no. Our experience indicates that we attracted investment from countries with whom we had no um, uh, investment agreement. And the contrary would also be true, that we attracted very little or no flows from countries where we had bilateral investment treaties. So the issue of the correlation between investment protection and investment flows, in our case, has, has been borne out uh, to the effect that um, uh, what we saw was that there was at least, well, if, if any, uh, a very slight relationship between bilateral investment treaties and, of course, um, investment flows. A second point that I'd like to make is that once we were challenged publicly, we immediately launched um, a public consultation process. So for any countries that are in, the, in this process, what we did was we said, well, there's a lot of requests to negotiate bilateral investment treaties, but let's suspend those negotiations, enter into a public consultation phase, and uh, the outcome of that public consultation phase was very emphatic. Firstly, that um, bilateral investment treaties impacted um, our right to regulate, um, and as a result, needed to be relooked. It wasn't specific necessarily in what needed to be done, but a year later, our, our cabinet made a decision that we should terminate bilateral investment treaties, that we should substitute um, any regime of protection with a national system, and of course, as, as Natalie said, uh, we've embedded in the system many uh, procedural uh, and also substantive uh, protections, uh, including national treatment. Um, but what we've done was we also looked at um, dispute prevention, so the ombudsman system, and, and ultimately we've tried to accommodate investors uh, in this way. So South Africa has actually withdrew about 10 years ago, as you heard from two ISDS cases. Uh, I'm not sure what I'm doing. And as you know, South Africa is a country that still receives a lot of investment. I wanted to show you this because um, a lot of you're probably going to ask me at some point, well, you know, countries have signed to this. So obviously there is something comes out, out of it, right, of the bilateral investment treaties with ISDS. Well, in the case of um, South Africa, as he was saying, there was BITs with ISDS don't actually give you more investment. Because in Europe, there's been a huge debate around CETA, the deal with Canada and TTIP, the deal between the EU and the United States. And the Commission, or the negotiators for the European Union, were always saying, well, it's going to bring job, it's going to bring investment, this is needed. And as you see from the example with South Africa, it's not actually always the case. Brazil has never, never signed, until now, uh, a bilateral uh, investment treaty with ISDS, and it's a country that attracts a lot of foreign uh, investment. So the correlation between ISDS and actually jobs or growth or investment is not actually proven. And here I'm giving you a link as well when you see uh, at, during the campaign there was a lot of academics that also sustained that point that you don't actually need ISDS in order to bring investment. So obviously, and now that you've seen what all the problems, you should be convinced by now that it's not a good idea. <laughs> at least that's what I've tried. Uh, uh, when the negotiations started in the European Union about TTIP, so with the US, and CETA with Canada, there was a lot of opposition from the public. So the Commission, what they, were, what they started to do was a consultation. They put on a website a survey, a questionnaire, where you could just answer and give your opinion on ISES. About 150,000 people answered that survey, which is like, never really happens, because nobody really knows how, to, how this works in the EU. And 
of the respondents were against ISDS. They asked for a different kind of arbitration, if any arbitration. Uh, this was not only you know, uh, critical NGOs like us, it was also trade unions. You had small and medium companies also that were against it, because they believed that this was unfair, because the procedure is so expensive that it's only available for big players, and small players don't actually get this right. And also lenders in Germany that were against it after what happened in Hamburg. And we were talking in this case about Bavaria, which is a conservative region in Germany. And they were against it because they were scared that it would be used against any local rules, as like happened in Hamburg. So in 2015, we have the European Parliament that actually asks uh, the Commission to change ISDS. So the Commission to change ISDS, and it becomes ICS, the Investment Court System. In the words of the Commissioner, ISDS had become too toxic in the debate, so we had to come up with something new, and they came up with... ICS, investment court system. To us, it's only cosmetic changes. It's what you say in English, it's putting lipstick on a pig. But now we have the investment court system. It's much, in terms of wording, it's better because you have court inside there. So it looks like it's actually public uh, and it's uh, unfortunately still private. If you can see, okay, you can see, right. What has changed now is, um, so you have traders, the people, we don't call them judges because the judge has a salary. So the judge, whatever they decide, whatever the decision on case, they'll still have a job the next day. An arbitrator, they all pay, they have a fee. Their decision has actually has an impact on their job. In the case of Philip Morris, when Philip Morris goes to Sidley Austin, gives them money to sue Australia and choose an arbitrator. The arbitrator, he knows that if he gives the right to Philip Morris, then the next case, he'll probably be chosen by Philip Morris. To, so then he'll probably have a job again. So you, you have a conflict of interest there, which this hasn't been uh, changed because you still are paid by a pay case with the new, so the ICS is in CETA, with the new ICS. The difference being that you chosen from a pool of 15 people. So now the countries will decide the kind of arbitrators that can be uh, arbitrators. Still, the thing is, yeah, you still have more, cost, more cases equal more money, and also you have very few, as I was telling you, it's a very small club of arbitrators. So even if they're chosen from a pool of 15 people by the states, we, we might actually find out the same people because it's very uh, close world. Now what you have, if the ICS is you have an appeal, and you have a stronger ethic rules, but it's, it's not great. And one of the problems also is, although you have an appeal, you still under an investment treaty, investment lawyers that decide on public health, environmental regulations, anti-smoking legislation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So clearly, to us, this has not changed much. This is from the largest association of judges in in Germany. In February, when they saw the new ISDS, the ICS, they said that to them, it's still not an independent court. And to them, it's more a permanent court of arbitration. But although we have a new name, we still, to us, we still have the same bias in the sense that <coughs> investors still get more rights, they still get the right to sue, get lots of money for public interest legislation. And also, it's a, a significant transfer of power as well, because you give the right to private arbitrators to decide whether a law is good or not for investors, it gives take away quite a lot of, of power. I want to finish with a few of the things that are happening now. Um, there's actually a lot of discussions to have. Is anybody from the UK? Oh, no. <laughs> um, with Brexit, you will have probably a trade deal between the EU and the UK. And there's a lot of discussions with actually including uh, the new ISDS of the EU, so ICS, in this trade deal. And it's been very, it has been considered a lot. Freshfields, one of the top three players that I showed you before. Freshfields is actually lobbying for that, saying that you will need to, get to give obligations to investors and you will need a court. So there's a lot of lobbying to get ISD, uh, ICS, in this case, um, in the EU-UK trade deal, which means that as an investor, for instance, in Romania, you can get a subsidiary in the UK to be able to sue Romania if there's any new law that you don't like. So it's quite controversial. Freshfields, the big uh, law firm, the ones that are making lots of money, 
has recruited somebody from the European Commission. Have you heard about the former Commissioner for Finance? Jonathan Hill. Mr. Hill was a lobbyist for the finance industry in the city of London. Then he became Commissioner for Finance during this commission, this is Juncker Commission. After the Brexit vote, he resigned and he went to work for Freshfield. He's actually pushing a lot with Freshfield to have ICS because the finance industry would like to use ICS because if the UK becomes a financial hub where there are less regulation in the UK than the EU, then investors will be able to sue the EU for any new regulation of the financial system. So they want really to use it also as a way to keep pressure on the European Union. And at the same time, while well, I talk to you about all those rights that investors get, when there is a discussion in the UN in Geneva on all the obligations that we could give to multinationals when they invest in another country, obligation like respecting human rights and environmental, and the EU is actually mostly EU member states are blocking a lot. This is the UN called the UN Binding Treaty, which on, hum, on business and human rights, which will give obligations to multinationals to respect human rights. So I wanted to finish with those questions for you to consider. What are the rights and responsibilities of multinationals? Who defines them? Who pay for the risk that the investors take when they invest in a foreign country? And why should public decisions be contested in private courts? Thank you. So thanks again, Laura, for the insightful presentation. Now me and Jinan are going to make some comments uh, about it. Here's our outline. First, we're going to have a brief summary of uh, the things that have been presented. So uh, profiting from injustice, uh, what the reports uh, call for, the change for ICS, what does it really change, or if not, the ide ideology behind ISDS that uh, Jinan is going to present about it. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about the Latin American cases uh, that uh, have been published in this recent report that Laura also has presented from the Transnational Institute. And uh, at the end, we conclude with some discussion points. Uh, we took this very nice uh, quote from the report that uh, we had to, to that uh, was presented by Laura. And uh, it argues that uh, ISTS is a legal institutional piece for the neoliberal puzzle and it constrains both government and the democratic choice in uh, trying to protect environment and uh, uh, the society to the benefit of these multinational corporations. What the report calls for is for a change regarding the independence and the transparency of the bodies, that the arbitrators are both independent and impartial, that uh, though regulations to guard against conflicts of interest can be implemented, a cap on the legal costs that she has uh, uh, highlighted that are extremely high, greater transparency regarding government lobbying uh, by the industry, but would this be enough? Thank okay. you. Uh, the second point we talk about is uh, ICS, what does it really change? So as we can see that ICDS allow companies and firms to sue governments if policy changes will affect their profit. And even if this include uh, uh, more regulation about public health or environment. So what we can see that ICS didn't really put an end for ICDS. At the fact, it's, it was the opposite. It gives more power for companies uh, at the expense of the national system. Then, uh, uh, is the best uh, quote to represent this idea is by uh, Van Harten, expert in international investment law, where he says, ICS is merely a, a rebranding exercise for ICDS because ICDS is alive in the European Commission recent proposal. When people say that ICDS is dead, it makes me think of a zombie movie because I see ICDS walking around in this new proposal all over the places. So is it really changing? No. Um, now I will talk about the ideology behind ICDS. In order to understand these treaties, we have really to understand the ideology behind it and where they come from. 
as you know, neoliberalism gives this idea of a free movement of capital, uh, assets, investments, and this can be uh, materialized in the form of these investment treaties, which is mainly through uh, BIT and through NAFTA and other treaties. So, there is a book by, uh, it calls Constitutionalizing Economic Globalization, Investment Rules and Democracy Promises. It shows that the regimes of investment really rules can be understood as emerging from a super supra constitution that can supersede domestic constitutional norms and at the end it gives more binding constraint designed to insult economic policy from vegetarian politics. And at the same time, how it's really affecting the role of the state. And this is the question that we have to ask about how these treaties are affecting the role of the state. And we can, what we can find, as it's uh, mentioned by the book, that it's really economic globalization is usually thought of as, a, as happening out there, beyond the capacity of a state to control, and at the first, the same time, we can see in this concept the state is being decentered, rendered de-effective or hold out. So it's also deeply implicated in the process of its presumed marginalization by establishing through law the personal bound of state actions. So this desire to render national economics the subject of uniform trade and investment regulation it lowered the capacity to experiment politi uh, politically and re reduce citizenship to a single uniform consumption organized around the value of the market. So wh what is the relationship here it become between the citizenship is always around the value and you don't have the rule of the state in this sense and you don't have the rule of the individual within the state rather than it's always about the free market concepts. At the end it's really harming the uh, democracy and it's kind of extracting grants or benefits for specific companies through contracts, loan, concession. Now, um, Maria will talk about cases in Latin America. So there was this very nice report published in the end of 2017 that uh, talks about the Latin American and Caribbean cases that Laura has presented a figure on it from the Transnational Institute. Uh, it's not working. <laughs> I think it restarted the error. Uh, so, as uh, Laura had already mentioned, today Latin America is the region that has the highest numbers of uh, investors' uh, state uh, arbitration cases. And uh, the champions are, as you can see, uh, Argentina and Venezuela. And uh, from the um, 817 cases that had been uh, uh, claimed uh, at the global level today, 234 cases were in Latin America, and this represents 28, uh, more than 28% of the total amount. Uh, the numbers and uh, who has been the, the who have been the countries that lost the most these cases, again, it's Argentina and Venezuela. And um, the amount of uh, money paid is actually 20,588 million US dollars, and this is equivalent of half of Argentina's public health budget, and four years of health and education budget for Bolivia. Uh, the report, the report uh, says that uh, there is a scope for change, and uh, some examples are Brazil, South Africa, Bolivia, Ecuador, and Venezuela. Uh, some countries never concluded international investment uh, treaties, uh, which is the example of Brazil. South Africa has been uh, withdrawn from some uh, bilateral investment treaties. Bolivia, Ecuador and Venezuela terminated existing agreements and uh, have um, not signed new ones. In the case of Australia, they are trying to exclude the investor states dip dispute settlements uh, from the investment agreements that they already have. Here is again uh, one uh, example of Brazil, because Brazil has uh, never actually managed to sign one 
uh, nor a bilateral investment treaty nor a free trade agreement with ISTS on it. And one emblematic case is the case of the ALCA that is, uh, was uh, pledged 23 years ago and uh, due to a campaign by the former president of Brazil and the former president of Venezuela, they managed to not sign the agreement and this would be one of the agreements that would have ISTS on it. So since it, they succeeded to not sign it, uh, we do not have this, this problem in, at least in Brazil. In the cases of uh, Bolivia, Ecuador and Venezuela, uh, they have terminated several of these uh, investment treaties and have withdrawn from the uh, ICSID, which is the International Center for Settlements and Investment Dispute, which is ruled by the World Bank. Uh, Bolivia was the first state to denounce the, the convention in 2007 already. And uh, it has also denounced six of its uh, bilateral investment treaties with Austria, Germany, Netherlands, Spain, Sweden and the US and one free trade agreement uh, with the investment chapter with Mexico. Uh, nevertheless, it still has uh, 14 of these bilateral investment treaties in force, all of them including ISDS. So there is a still space for claims being holded against Bolivia despite these advances that have been made recently. Uh, Ecuador following Bolivia also denounced the ICSID convention. This was in 2010 terminated uh, 10 of its uh, bilateral investment treaties with Cuba, Dominican Republic, El Salvador, Finland, Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua, Paraguay, Romania and uh, Uruguay. Although it has uh, done its, this process as well, it still has uh, 16 of uh, BITs in force, including ISDS. Here is the interesting case of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela and uh, in 2012 they actually also denounced the ECSID convention after Bolivia and Ecuador. Uh, it was just after Argentina the champion in uh, cases and disputes in Latin America. Uh, at that time they had 20 cases pending uh, 10 had been initiated only in 2011 and this can, can be explained due to the reforms that have been implemented by the government in power then. Um, and uh, what we can question here is what would really change with this denounce of the convention in 2012 by Venezuela. According to the law, uh, the pending cases would not be affected uh, by the denunciation of the ECSID convention and the foreign investors would still be able to initiate new cases until six months after the denounce and this would be July since it was uh, denounced in January. According to the article 71 of the convention uh, this would be the law and the rights and of uh, bringing claims after this date, which is July 2012 then, uh, are not so clear. Uh, the Venezuelan government uh, argued back then that the ICSID convention was against the Venezuelan constitution that uh, expressly excludes foreign claims from public interest and contracts and that's exactly what uh, ISTS is doing. Uh, in this occasion the Venezuelan government also terminated uh, BIT with the Netherlands but it still has uh, 27 BITs in force. The case of Argentina is also very interesting because most of the cases that have been uh, uh, claimed against the country have been done in the course of the crisis, so right after 2001, the 2000s, because of the economic reforms that have been implemented. And uh, at the moment, what the government is trying to do is refusing to pay the arbitration awards. Um, so um, uh, Lazo, which uh, writes on international law and alternatives in the case of Latin America, says that uh, an alternative that has been pushed uh, forwards by the Latin American countries to the uh, ICSID of the World Bank has been uh, not uh, surprisingly not having domestic courts 
but actually having a regional center for the settlement of investment disputes inside the UNASUR and, an in, and also initiatives uh, endorsed by the ALBA and uh, MERCOSUR, which would include uh, both investor states dispute and state state uh, dispute. So what uh, would be the outcome of this? It's not uh, sure yet and it's to be seen. Now we have some discussion points. So, when we speak about these treaties, uh, we, sp we spoke about many cases, we spoke about the idea behind them, we spoke about the ideology. But there is always about different ideas between different claims and between different researchers. So we have really to understand them and to put claims together in one concept. So what we are saying is, is like there is um, uh, Mataroni in 2016, he was speaking about TTB and he was speaking about the idea behind TTB and he was saying, is it really an inventive experiment to establish regulatory cooperation and convergence to reduce regulatory barriers or is it really against state sovereignty, democratic legitimacy and accountability? Second, is it really to trade, uh, is it really to promote trade, growth, employment, and uh, uh, decreasing trade barrier? Or is it about new powerful weapon of a globalist to abuse trade liberalization for the domination of the world by the biggest and the richest for their own benefit and to determine of the many, the small, and the poor? So, who is really benefiting from this? Then, is it really around breaking a new instrument aiming to renew liberalization and regulation of international trade? Or is it really more about well-functioning multilateral world trading system by creating a preferential trade area for countries representing almost 50% of a global output by discriminating against the many and the weak uh, outside of this framework? So who is really benefiting from these uh, treaties? We have really to ask this question to understand if it's really valid or not. And this will lead us to some questions by uh, Maria. Uh, so then what would be the alternatives besides uh, not signing any further BIT of uh, free trade agreement with ISDS? And or how to break with this uh, ISDS that are already within treaties that have been signed? Uh, do they expire? Uh, what about the Latin American uh, alternative to promote a regional center? Uh, it's uh, not, I, I don't think it's mentioned by the reports or what is this, uh, of the perspective of this alternative? And one critical thing that I think we have to actually think about is that uh, the ones that are in favor of ISDS is regarding the attraction of FDIs to the country. Do we really wish to have more FDIs in flows? Are they actually helping the development strategy and sovereignty of the countries. These are our app references and thanks for the attention. Uh, now I think we can uh, discuss the points that we have uh, mentioned briefly and then we can open the floor for discussions and questions. Okay, I'll, I'll quickly um, answer and then I'll keep. Um, just before going to the points, I think you made also two things that are important. Um, later in the debate that I show you on video, the um, person working for the South African Embassy, he was asking a question about investment and you know we talk a lot about FDI and the quantity of it and he was also putting the point of quality and he was saying it's important for a country to be able to, dis to actually ask for quality investment and not short term mm. or speculative investment or in investment that means that in 10 years you'll get an ISDS case. So, so impo important when you talk about FDI because most of the time it's all about figures and the amount, but the quality is also important. What does it bring to the country, this FDI? Also, in terms of strong and weak countries, and you were talking about TTIP, uh, the reasons why we have more bilaterals is also because the World Trade Organization has not managed to conclude the Doha round. And the reason why the Doha round has not been concluded is because the weakest country 
the smallest country or the less developed countries in the world, they got together and they started understanding that this is not actually good for development. And they refused it. And because they were refusing it in world trade organizations, then big players like the EU and the US are trying to impose it by making deals which will actually encircle the countries. So it's also important to think in terms of the power relations and what's also keeping in mind what's happening in the World Trade Organization. Um, you can, ISDS is, is in a bilateral investment treaty. In those treaties, there's a, a clause of termination. So each treaty explains to you how you can terminate it. So you can break away from ISDS. They don't ex they can expire sometimes and get renewed, and then you can just say, I don't want it to be renewed, or there is a termination. You notify the other party that you want to terminate. This is something that countries don't do, not just Ecuador or South Africa. There's a, a treaty with ISDS called the Energy Charter. This is a treaty that was signed when uh, the wall fell in uh, um, 89. And the countries of uh, Eastern Europe, as well as uh, Russia and Central Asia republics, they signed this treaty because uh, the Western investors wanted to uh, m mostly extract oil and, and gas. So it's a treaty with ISDS, but only on energy. Italy has been used because Italy uh, banned drilling, oil drilling, too close to its shores. So I think now it's a 30, but I don't know if it's kilometers or miles. But there's the amount of uh, where well you, you cannot drill in the sea, basically. Otherwise, you would see it from the coast and you just can't. Uh, Italy has been sued for this because there was uh, a company that started prospecting for oil. So they, had, they hadn't built anything yet. They were prospecting by the fact that they prospected, they invested. So then they sued Italy and Italy just withdrew out of the energy charter. So it is something that you can do. States have the power to terminate this. Um, unfortunately, the Latin American alternatives is on hold now because of the change of government in Brazil. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> the interesting thing about Brazil is Brazil has uh, what it calls mediation. So, for instance, if a Vale has a problem in Mozambique, um, the Brazilian investor has the right to seize the embassy, and the embassy then uh, enters into diplomatic uh, mediation with the country where the investor is investing. So it is uh, trying to go through mediation through uh, the two embassies, through diplomatic, which is what was happening, you know, like 100 years ago. Before ISDS, it was diplomatic rules. An investor would actually go to its embassy and ask for uh, protection, diplomatic protection. And so Brazil has this kind of, um, of settlement. Obviously, it works for Brazil because it's a big investor, so uh, Brazil in Mozambique also has kind of a, the balance of power is towards Brazil. Also, it also has a, a power implications. Um, yeah, and then I think I answered the one after. Um, well, you did a really good presentation, so I just, uh, yeah, I don't, uh, I don't answer uh, questions. About the court and the set up by the Latin American countries, so in the Women's Food, Mercosur, and Alba. Uh, is it in case that you know more about it? Because I think this package is on from 2016-17. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure if it has been implemented or not. No, I don't, no, I don't think it's been implemented. Uh, it hasn't been implemented, no. <laughs> okay, thank you. I think now we can open the floor for our discussion, for questions. We take a first round of the three questions and then we keep going. Okay. I'm Benedict, uh, I'm from Germany, and the, the macro option. Uh, seeing that you, so thank you so much for the presentation first, and seeing that you come from kind of a lobbying NGO sector, I'd like to ask you on your views of, t of mobilization of civil society, because last year I think uh, the level of mobilization that we have observed in the EU against CETA was something that one rarely sees, and yet it was defeated. Um, so what are your views going forwards? As, as you want. Okay, I can answer. Yeah, as you want. As, as you prefer. 
Okay, well, I'll answer now then. <laughs> then I'm sure. Um, so give you, to give you a bit of context, so um, CETA, well, I, I explained in Belgium the agreement with Canada, with Canada that has ICS. It was signed uh, one year and a half ago now. And two years ago in Berlin, there was a demonstration with 250,000 people on the streets against CETA and TTIP. Um, this rarely happens first on trade, but also on EU politics. It's so it was a, to us, it was great, but it was also very, it was very new. Um, so it was really wide and big at that time, and now it's gone down. The reason being that it went through Parliament in February last year, the European Parliament, and now it's going to go through different national parliaments. So in the countries where it's very controversial, like Germany, it keeps being postponed and postponed. So for the moment, the mobilization is a bit down. But I think that once the agenda, it will come back on the agenda in Germany, it will become big again. Mm -hmm. So now the, agen the agenda before was at Europe level. Now it's gone for the European Parliament. And then it it's different timings according to uh, countries around the e European Union. There are countries where it's a huge thing, like in Italy. Is anybody from Italy? Yeah, uh, there's elections in March. Yeah. yeah. And Movimento Cinque Estrelle, I think it's, it's like this, is actually campaigning against it in its campaign against CETA. But the problem we face also is due to the fact that it's something popular, that people are start knowing what it is, TTIP and CETA, in a lot of countries, including not so much Germany, but in France, for instance, or in Italy, then you define how you want Cinque Estrelle, but um, a lot of far right countries and populist uh, uh, parties have actually used a lot the campaign to gain votes. And this is a real issue because obviously they're against CETA and TTIP for very different reasons. But they've understood that the, how people feel against it, strongly against it, and they're using it for votes. So it, it, it becomes a bit difficult as well in this sense. But um, I think the more people are aware, usually the more they uh, mobilize against it, but then the, the timings become different across countries now. Um, hello, my name is Julian. I'm from Ocean B. I come from Argentina, so this was particularly interesting. <coughs> so, uh, first, I have a question. It's like I wanted to know which is the origin of the, um, the national origin of the companies <laughs> that are making most of the demands. Let's say, are they from the US, as I would expect? Because it was really interesting that this is affecting all states and not just developing or underdeveloped countries. The second one is, and regarding the discussion point that Jenan and, and Maria raised, like which is the alternative? I was thinking about this parallel with debt restructuring at the international level. So I wanted to know if maybe a procedure like it was uh, proposed by the Argentinian government to the United Nations, like a debt restructuring procedure firsthand, if that would potentially be a solution. And third, I wanted to know the relationship between these trade disputes and the financial disputes that have been uh, carrying on by the Club de Paris, or the Paris Club, sorry, and those institutions. Ah, sorry, fourth. <laughs> um, the Argentinian government was refusing to pay before. Now they are issuing debt uh, in order to pay uh, all that they are claiming. I think we will take one more and then uh, because we'll <laughs> um, Hi, my name is um, Eric from Option A. Um, we're on the knowledge and innovation um, option. Um, I want to thank you for your presentation, but um, I'm not fully convinced that we should get rid of ISDS. Um, and my, my source of contention is primarily having been an observer um, of stakeholder groups between government and industries in Southeast Asia from where I come from. Um, I think a huge assumption that we have to make is that states are impartial and are um, magnanimous in a sense. Because um, from where I'm from, at least from the Philippines, um, our government has solicited um, investments from big corporations throughout the years. And when there has been an administration change, they completely changed the rules of the game, even if they've already uh, held on to the investment. And 
I'm not sure if states would be impartial in handing out decisions if we um, completely abolish ISDS and allow states to, to rule on their own. And the other th issue I have is that it seems like in terms of drawing public support, um, gov politicians have been successful in um, ra uh, rounding out public support even if they're not really telling the entirety of the story. I was fascinated by the example you've given between Chevron and Ecuador. And it seems to me that there's cir circumstantial evidence at best that link Chevron um, with the oil spill in Ecuador. And somehow Ecuador has been able to weaponize that small link and turn it against Chevron. So, I mean, what other alternatives are there apart from ISDS? Most of the demands, so most of the, the uh, is where does the um, investor come from, right? I was, yeah, I don't have Wi-Fi, but uh, you can see on the website, I don't want to say, uh, I don't have the exact figures in mind, but um, it's mostly Dutch, but because the Netherlands has a lot of BITs, and it's easy to open a mailbox company in the Netherlands, and, uh, and the US, US, a lot of US investors. Um, in terms of the... Um, the U.S., for instance, has never lost a case until now, and it's mostly because most of the case happens in the World Bank, and the president of the World Bank has to be American. Um, there was a, a case against the U.S. when the Obama decided to stop Keystone Pipeline by TransCanada, and then Trump decided that Keystone was going to go again, so now that case is dropped. There's very still... Canada has been sued a lot, Mexico as well, but under NAFTA there's few cases against the US, mostly because investors know that most of the time they'll lose anyway, so it's not worth the money. Um, in terms of uh, the alternative, in terms of procedures, there's a lot of calls, especially in the UN, for making it under the UN, so having, with, with judges, so with uh, people with salaries. So you will have a UN expert, not only on investment law, but on human rights law and environmental protection and other t types of laws, but also public in the sense that, yeah, a salary, a job for a long time, and then the decision doesn't have an impact. Um, there's a lot of the cases against Argentina, are a lot on debt and finance. So there's also cases against Cyprus and Greece when the debt was restructured. There's a report here that I brought on this. Um, and actually what happened is ISDS really became a boom when there was a case against Sri Lanka by uh, an English investor in Sri Lanka. He had a shrimp factory and um, there, was a, there were rebels in uh, Sri Lanka and the rebels were actually hiding in the shrimp factory. They were going underwater. So the army just bombarded the shrimp factory. And he used the fact that one of the persons that had investors in the shrimp factory was from Hong Kong to sue Sri Lanka. So an investor that had put some money on, but only it was only finance. There was no other thing. And then that's when the, in the arbitration industry realized that you could actually have people only financially investing without being there. And then that's how it was used in the financial end with debt. That's as much as I know about debt in Argentina and restructuring, I'm afraid. But it, it, it's one of the problems, for instance, with Greece, when the debt bonds were renegotiated. They were renegotiated under UK law, some of them. So then they were entitled to uh, yeah. ISDF because the UK has more bilateral investment treaties than Greece. Um, states are impartial, obviously, and um, but hopefully the courts are more independent. So what I would like to show you is Maybe on the principles, um, we disagree. Like you believe that it's important to have an alternative way of to re resolve disputes because states are impartial and courts can't actually always be independent. But I'm not sure that the ones that we have now actually work because this is a really a money-making machine that is actually taking a lot of money away from states. It's also a way for only big players to actually sue, not smallest ones. It has also... There's third-party funding now, so it means that you have uh, hedge funds, for instance, that would finance a case for an investor and get 10% back of the compensation. So if you had arbitrators that were maybe less from that small club but maybe more open, that were also had qualifications outside an investment, then maybe 
then maybe that would be still better than ISDS. Also, there's a, an issue with this is that if you have a problem with the politics of the state, how much does a foreign investor has to do with trying to change the politics of the state? And also, if the national courts don't work, when you create a parallel system, you actually make them weaker. So there's all those questions as well. That, uh, and this is why there's this idea that within the UN, with a judge and with people knowing outside of investment, you could have an alternative way of. But then again, if you're in the UN, you don't have the same in, uh, enforcement. Because the problem with the judgment of the UN is then the UN probably won't have the right to go and seize the ESS. In this case, something that's very strong, especially with Argentina, is that when Argentina decided not to pay because it was too much money and it, it was undergoing a financial crisis, um, is the whole judicial system behind it to actually seize Argentina assets outside of Argentina. And there were Boeings from Aerolinas Argentinas They were actually grounded in, in the US and seized. And if you had a UN procedure, you would also need to make sure that it can be enforced. And it would be very difficult. And it would be very hard also to convince countries like the US to go through the UN system. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. My name is Adga. I'm from Indonesia. And you might be aware, I'm sure you are aware, that there has been some developments regarding BIT in Indonesia. So in 2014, our, co our government actually announced that they would want to terminate every single BIT they are having as of that time, which is a big deal because we had 67 in total BITs with countries around the world. Many of them has been going on for decades, so it was a big deal. And Actually, our government also announced that their explicit concern is mainly with ISDS. They say that uh, they, they've been sued two years prior to that by an Australian mining company, and maybe that is one of the reasons. But the thing is that they want, they want, them, they want them to... Basically, their green design is uh, to, to abolish, the, uh, to, to go out from the ISDS regime and to make it so that every investor settlement dispute is going through the local court. And, from my observation, not much has been going on from that project. Not, no, not much progress has been made to make, that, to, be, to make that concretized in a way, because, well, it's quite unorthodox, I think, to have that settled, to have, to have that kind of thing settled in a local court. But I'm curious about uh, what is your opinion on this, uh, on the settlement of investor dispute in local court? Because I'm, I'm also agree in some way to my colleague that, well, there are some evil companies indeed, but coming from Southeast Asia, I know there are some evil governments as well. So it might not really help that much if we just pass the problem to the government. So I'm quite, I'm quite, uh, I'm quite concerned that it might not solve the problem at all, if any. So uh, if also if maybe there has been cases where this kind of things happen, the settlement dispute is settled in a local court and whether that ever happened before maybe or and and uh, how 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 willing are the companies to follow this kind of framework maybe so that will be all thank you um, in terms of uh, local courts uh, the case of Vattenfall that I show is actually being uh, pursued at the local courts at the same time so the company has done both um, one interesting thing that is happening is India India, what they do is they ask for what they call, in legal terms, it's called exhaustion of local remedies. So you can only have access to ISDS if you can prove that you've been discriminated in local courts. So you have to go to local courts first, and if you're unhappy with the treatment, and if you think it's impartial, impartial then you can go to ISDS. And this is actually <coughs> quite interesting because it means that that the companies have to prove. It also means that publicly it shows what's wrong with the courts of India, so it creates a debate. It's actually, and it's in a, in a way, to investors prove that they're being discriminated and ask for a better justice system. So there's a, that, that, that's a, a good impulsive. And then if they are, then they go ISDS. But that also breaks all the financial sector around ISDS. It means that the hedge funds, for instance, will not come to you for an ISDS case. And also what happens is once ISDS starts, there's been so much things happening at the national level, then, then the ISDS case is shorter. So even if the investor wins, it's still less money for India because it's two years instead of five, so it's less legal cost for India. So that could be an alternative. One more round. 
Um, hello, I'm Jelena from Option A. Um, I just wanted to ask about the enforcement of the treaties. As you just mentioned a few minutes ago about the Argentina that said they didn't want to pay. And you mentioned also the case of Libya, which for me was very, very interested because they were sued by investors, as you said, because the war happened. Mm -hmm. And as we know, in the uh, days of war, like it, uh, emergency state is declared, the governments and the budgets are very in a different position than they are before. So I want to know, was there a country uh, coming back from, from the evil governments that maybe have said or find a way not to pay this? Uh, because if, if this is a way like insurance for, uh, for investors, uh, it doesn't work like a normal insurance because in normal insurance you actually get when you are paid exactly and when you are not. So were there the, the, the countries that said, okay, the war wasn't something we could have expected, so we are not going to pay? Thank you. We collect two more questions. Hello, uh, my name is Hayom. I don't have a question, but I just want to add something. Uh, at some point, I, I would uh, agree with Eric uh, for having the uh, ISDS uh, because uh, if we if we talk about like small countries or developed countries, uh, I would say maybe corrupt countries. In this case, uh, I'm in favor of uh, ISDS because a place uh, where I'm come from usually uh, it's a small country and. Uh, the thing is, I have seen uh, several uh, businesses that got uh, destroyed uh, by, I would, by uh, other parties uh, because uh, what, I, uh, what I think is there are some people actually, for, like people from the government, sometimes they use the power of government to protect themselves actually, rather than the state. They, uh, they say that they, uh, they, they uh, make new laws actually uh but th but the, in reality that those laws actually uh, are in favor of themselves rather than the states so that's why uh, i just uh, this is my personal idea that uh, sometimes it's better for some countries to have the this kind of uh, like isds things to protect investors thank you Hi, my name is Maria Mohammed. I'm from Pakistan. I just wanted to shed some light on this bilateral agreements on one account. Um, what I perceive is like uh, they try to transpass the domestic politics and the um, domestic um, industries basically that are actually trying to emerge in that particular country. I'll try to exemplify in the case of Germany. We recently had an agreement in terms of Pakistan with Germany. We had a huge gold mine in Pakistan, in Balochistan, where um, a, 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 an international bid took place for mining there. And as we know, in these bilateral agreements, majorly a lot of uh, money in the agreements are majorly on the mining and stuff and oiling. So uh, what happened basically, a, ger a German company actually won that bid and uh, they started mining that place. The idea was basically that uh, for me it's a very power related game if you see. Like uh, because German uh, Germans being more powerful than Pakistani economy itself, uh, the agreement was a 55% of trade deal and it was like 55% of the revenue will go to German account and the rest will come to Pakistani account because of the mining, the process that is taking place. But later on, what they started to do that the port that were, they were using in Balochistan, they started moving half of the resources from there and there was a huge um, a, a kind of protest that took place all over the country against it. And a government was kind of uh, very negligent on this because obviously they could not sue the um, German Germans on this and I don't know it's kind of a very power game and uh, while doing so most of the local entrepreneurs are destroyed in this process because a lot of local companies in Pakistan they actually presented uh, 
took part in the bid and they wanted to do this mining but they were not given the project because Germans were more trusted but later on the agreement was kind of shattered and Germans had to move out and China has to come into it and it was really devastating situation for the people like people were employed then unemployed and then like it for me I want you to just shed some light on that thank you and then we have a last round. Okay. Um, in the case of, of Libya, it's because the treaty gives the right to invest it to a stable environment. To, so that you have the right to a stable environment. And then the investor believes that Libya hasn't done enough for that stable environment. So in a way, Libya is responsible for starting the war, for at least pr not preventing that war to start. So that's, that's the argument. And... The problem is the enforcement, so that's the judgment. And once the judgment is out there, there's no way you can change it. Mm -hmm. And the enforcement then happens at the local level, and it's the national courts that use that um, statement, uh, that case, ruling, and enforce it at a national level. But they, that's the only thing they can do. So it means the investor sees that, for instance, Libya has money in Italy, and it goes to Italian courts to reclaim Libyan assets in Italy. But he cannot question the ruling, because there's no appeal possible. There is one with ICS, but not with ISDS. Which means that if you're not going to pay, then you, you have a state inf infringing national laws, and it's, it's, it's not possible. You have, you have to pay. In the case of uh, UCOS, uh, it was billions that UCOS, that Russia had to pay. And there are rulings, for instance, happening now in Paris where the investor is trying to seize money from the Russian embassy. And then if Russia doesn't respect French law, there will be a diplomatic problem, so they will have to, to give the money. It's interesting what you were saying about ISDS that could be useful in least developing it's, it's certain countries, but you know who will define which countries you have ISDS with and without? And then if the situation evolves, how do you break away from ISDS? Because then it becomes... There's a lot of um, links between, with you know, the, the politicians, the arbitration. There's so much money to be made that if you were had a country that were improving in terms of investment regime, how would you break away from ISDS? You'll get a lot of political opposition to stop ISDS. And, and also, who will have the right to decide whether a country is a good, uh, needs ISDS or not? You know? it's, it's a very political decision to make. Um, my name is Luca, I'm from Option A, um, Innovation, and um, you were mentioning um, insurances as maybe feasible alternative actually for companies um, to secure their uh, investment. And I wanted to ask you to expand a bit on that. Is, there, is it actually a feasible alternative and is there already an uh, um, insurance market in place that um, um, companies can actually go to and secure their investments and how that would be maybe in a market alternative to um, to the le legal so solution. So in some... Oh, um, now that I've heard so many positive words mm -hmm. for uh, ISDS, I, I, I thought I... I Clink myself in there. I have a I have a suggestion to kind of combine all of these two. Why don't we make these courts into real courts and then power for good? Because at the moment they're not courts. It's it's a it's a it's a weird thing. If we make it in two way streets and allow all stakeholders and shareholders to uh, get their rights uh, respected, I think it could actually uh, be a good thing. So you can make. Uh, work conditions and uh, environmental protection was uh, also something subject to these courts uh, and allow local governments, etc., to sue. Hello, my name is Victoria. I'm from Option A. I would like to thank you for the presentation first. And um, referring to what you said about tobacco control and the health regulation, um, so if we're talking about the cases when the regulation can't really pass 
Um, my question is, who has to um, get a stronger position in society, government? What is the possible solution? Of course, if we agree on that, that the legislation has to pass, what can be done? And uh, maybe what are the steps which some governments are already taking? So what can be done to get a little low through even for there is ISDS? Yeah. Yes. Um, so you have insurance for political risks, but it's only for... Um, the difference with ISDS is that you would only get compensation for the money you invested. And not for the future lost profits, which is the big difference with ISDS. Um, you do get this. Obviously, some insurers don't want to insure you if you go and, and, and invest in very difficult countries like uh, Libya or other countries. You do also have the states, sometimes the foreign corporations that have offices where they help investors invest in unstable countries and they get the state also to secure some of the investment. So you also have other options. But again, the difference being you only get the money back for you know, the assets that you've been invested and you have to prove that they've been invested not in a corrupt way, which is not the case here neither as well. So. It exists, and when it doesn't, when the market doesn't exist, the states, I mean, it's France does it, the UK, the Netherlands, Germany, there's big, strong state that also have mechanism in order to secure your investment. So, um, and uh, what you were saying also is interesting with the two-way system, because why does, in the case of Pakistan, why do that the local inhabitants don't have the right to ISDS as well, you know? Why is it only the German company that can sue the state if they're not happy? Um, ISDS only happens after a decision has been made. So in a way, what it does, it's, it doesn't stop from legislation to go. It just puts pressure on the legislation before with a threat of ISDS. And after, once the legislation is in place, then you can be sued and you will have be asked to pay for all the impact of this legislation. What you can do, and it has been done, is uh, you can have some carve out. So in TPP, it's the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So it was going to be the US, the US withdrew. It was going to be the US, Chile, a lot of countries in Asia as well, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, Brunei, and uh, other countries as well, as well. So now the US is pulled out. But in TPP, there's what we call a carve out. So it means that you can't have ISDS for smoking, for instance for anti-tobacco uh, anti legislation. This has been carved out, so an investor cannot sue on for anti-tobacco. The problem being the carve-out has been to be strongly worded because there was a carve-out for public health in the treaty between um, Philip Morris and Uruguay. So, uh, sorry, between Switzerland and Uruguay. In this treaty, it said uh, ISDS can be used, but not for public health. And Philip Morris used this treaty to sue. At the end, they lost, but they still, but Uruguay still has to pay for the legal costs. So this carve-out was not strongly worded enough, so it has to be strongly worded. There's a lot of debate, especially by Gus, you, who you mentioned, about climate change carve-outs as well. Because with climate change, subsidies probably will, will go down for fossil fuels. There'll be subsidies for renewables. Some projects will become more difficult to implement. And obviously, here we see a lot of ISDS cases possible. You know, as you see with Latin America, there's a lot of oil mining. And, and there you could have a caravan on climate change. The government could claim that this is a legislation for climate change. But it really has to be strongly worded. I think uh, that's it. Thanks for, for coming. Thank you. Thanks for coming. <laughs> <laughs>